From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Dean, Johnny. Mono guarantee. Oh, hiya, Ralph. How are things? Rough. My wife could kill me, Johnny. For the insurance? No, just for kicks, because she's mad, because she wanted a mink coat. In short, she's a woman. I couldn't buy her a mink. I don't make that kind of money. You know how it is in the insurance game. Oh, sure, I know, Ralph. You're down to your last yetch. So what happens yesterday? I lose 80 mink coats, silver blue, worth $100,000. Gone, snatched, disappeared. Warehouse robbery? Check. Bandley Furriers out in Los Angeles. My wife's about to blow her stack. She says if I can't afford one fur coat for her, then how come I can pay for 80 of them that I haven't even got? How do you reason with a woman, Johnny? I never try. Usually I just send flowers. I've already done that. She ran them through the garbage disposer. So now what do I do? Buy some more flowers. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, 4312 Spring Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Silver Blue matter. <laughs> Item 1, $152.40, telephone and incidentals and transportation to Los Angeles. I called the Mono Guarantee agent out there before I left and got a brief rundown on the case. Among other things, I learned that a man I'd known and worked with before, Detective Lieutenant Raymond Garcia, had been put in charge. And with Garcia on hand, I knew I could count on cooperation by the police. But I still wasn't expecting quite as much as I got. Flight 12 for Las Vegas, Salt Lake, Minneapolis, and Chicago, now loading... I knocked over the fur joint myself, Johnny. Garcia! Only way we get to see you. How have you been? Overworked, underpaid, frustrated, disillusioned, unappreciated. In other words, fine. (laughs) Got your luggage yet? Uh, it's coming right there. Good. We ought to get moving. I've got a squad car outside. What's all the rush? We've got a guy downtown in the hospital I figured you'd want to talk to. Well, he'll wait, won't he? He'd probably like to, if he had any choice. He's dying? Kind of looks that way. He's one of the two night watchmen the gang slugged when they broke into the warehouse. And he's our big one, Johnny. He's all we've got. Has he been able to talk? A couple of sentences during the night. He's got to talk. What do you mean? He's the only one who got a look at them. When he did talk, what did he say? Gibberish, mostly. He did say one thing, though. They were kids. Just a gang of kids. Oh, that's going to make it rougher. Yeah, in a lot of ways. What do you mean? You'll find out later, Johnny. Come on, let's go. We took the freeway into town with the accelerator floorboarded and the siren screaming. Racing against time and against dying. Weaving in and out through the four-wheel madness that Los Angeles calls traffic. And then the other side of the coin. The solemn quiet of hospital corridors. The calm voices of the nurses. And the blank hardness of sterile white walls. We sat there beside a bed and waited for a man to talk or to die. But the slow minutes passed and he still did neither. So we waited. I guess that shot the doctor gave him is not going to have any effect. Apparently not. It's a crazy world, Johnny. No, just the people in it. I mean, yesterday, we'd never even heard of this guy. I still don't know his name. And 24 hours later, here we are, a couple of strangers sitting around watching him die. Yeah, it's here on his chart at the head of the bed. Albert Christmas. Strangers. Not even family or friends. He didn't have any family or friends. He lived alone in a furnished room. Worked alone, too, except for one partner. So, a gang of punks jump him and bust his head open. I'm a bad cop, Johnny. I I get sentimental about things like this. How'd they work it, Garcia? It's a warehouse district. The streets are practically deserted at night. A police prowl car checks the street once about every 40 minutes, and they hit at 1.10 a.m., three minutes after the police had passed. Sounds professional. No. Just a smart bunch of kids. The only fur they seemed to know was mink. They passed up a dozen or so chinchillas worth twice as much. How'd they get in? I don't know. Chrisman hasn't been able to tell us. They must have tricked him into opening the door. What about Chrisman's partner? He was making his rounds. They slipped up behind him, slugged him. He didn't see them. He didn't know what hit him. 
And nobody outside in the street saw anything? Saw them leave with the furs or anything? Nope. Or if they did, they're not saying anything. Oh, it's a rough one, Johnny. We haven't got a thing to go on. Except Chrisman here. The shape he's in, that's only a straw. If he recognized any of them, if he lives long enough to identify... Uh, at least the poor devil can groan. I don't know. I think he's closer to being conscious right now than he's been in the last hour. Maybe you're right. Chrisman? Order. He wants a drink. Yeah. Here you go. That enough? You want some more? Who are you? This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator from Hartford. I'm Lieutenant Garcia, L.A. Police. Warehouse. The kids. It's all right now. You're in the hospital now. It's going to be all right. My head. Do you feel like answering a few questions, Mr. Chrisman? It won't take long. Those kids, how did they get in? Telegram. Telegram? He showed me the telegram through the window. Yes. When I opened the door, one of them hit me. I... Did you get a look at the boy who showed you the telegram? Yes. Yeah. I, I saw him. Yeah? 18, 19... What did he look like? 5, 9... Ten, dark skin, black hair. Uh -huh. how, how was he dressed? Dark jacket. Hard to think. Any scars? Anything unusual about him? No. <laughs> My head. Are you sure? Sure. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. Any of the others? No. The only one. I... There was a mark. On his arm. What kind of a mark? My head. Oh, my head. What kind of a mark on his arm? Hurts too bad. I, I, I... Well, that's that. Yeah, he's passed out again. Well, we got a description. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Right in that area, there are about 50,000 kids who fit it. I talked with Mr. Banley, owner of the Furs. Then Garcia and I went down to the warehouse. It stood on the fringe of the river bottom section, fronting the railroad yards and backed up by block after block of weather-beaten slum shacks. We looked through the warehouse, at the racks where the Furs had hung, watchman's office where the gang had entered... But knew while we did it that we were only going through the motions. The police technicians had already been over the place inch by inch, and they'd found exactly nothing. Finally, we stepped out the door into the street, a drab gray street cluttered with things cast off and discarded, dusty and hollow. There's the story of this whole district down here, Johnny, right there in that street. Yeah. It's a backwash, a service yard. It's something you need but don't like to look at, so you shove it out of sight. People you need, but don't want around. It's the same with them. You grew up down here, didn't you, Garcia? Yeah, I grew up down here. That's why they gave me this case. I know this section inside out. And that's why I told you this one was going to be tough. I think I get the general idea. Those kids came from that slum there to the east. One gets you nine on that. The people who live there aren't on our side, Johnny. If they do know anything, they won't talk, is that it? They wouldn't tell a cop the time of day. I don't mean they're criminals. Most of them aren't. It's just that they always put themselves on the other side. What about juvenile gangs? Do they operate around here? Oh, dozens of them. And there's another thing. A few of these gangs are pretty rough, and people who might talk don't because they're scared to. Oh, it's a great setup, Johnny. A fine place to look for a hundred grand in furs. You know, I've been thinking about the fact that they knew exactly the time to hit. They must have staked out here somewhere. Sure, and probably right in the place you're thinking. Hey, that lunchroom across the street? Well, they had to be inside, or the prowl car would have seen them. That's the only place open at night. Did you shake it down? Like I told you, Johnny, they won't give us the time of day. Uh-huh. What about me having a go at it? Yeah, maybe they wouldn't smell cop on you quite so strong. The owner's name is Red Wellers. He was on that night. See what you can get out of him if you want. I think I will. By the way, Johnny... 
I know you insurance guys make deals sometimes, no questions asked, just to get the loot back. Sometimes, yeah. Well, before you make any deal on this one, you better remember one thing. Chrisman may die. Say, Mac. Save your money. What do you want? Coffee? Yeah, I guess so. How's business? Buck or two a day. Father in the hole. Want cream? No, I'll drink it black. Want to sink it with it? No, thanks. Are you Red Willis? So that's it. What do you mean? You're in a fur case, ain't you? Maybe. I thought you was the same one, but I couldn't be sure seeing you across the street. You come up with that cop Garcia a while ago, didn't you? That's right. I'm an insurance investigator. Well, you come to the wrong address, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. Who was in the lunchroom here just before the robbery? I don't remember. Any young kids here? No. It was all old men with long beards. I see. Ten cents for the coffee. Yeah, they got you real scared, haven't they? Haven't they? I don't know any of these. All right, look. You know Chrisman, the watchman over at the warehouse. He comes in. He didn't know any of these either. What about it? Nothing. Except he's dying. I'm at the Rilkins Hotel if you change your mind. Room 312, Johnny Dollar. Sorry. I don't see no use of me dying, too. Follow me, Mac. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, fear stalks the streets, closing the mouths of a sullen and suspicious people, terrifying a lonely girl, and bringing death in a dusty alley. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Red. Red Wallace, you remember? Sure, sure. You run that lunchroom across the street from the warehouse that was robbed last night. Yeah, that's right. Now, look, Donna, supposing I tell you what I know about it, what's going to happen to me? Nothing. As long as you weren't mixed up in it yourself. No, no, no. I mean the papers and the cops. If it gets out I talk to you, I won't last 24 hours. I think I can take care of that. What do you know about it, Red? That depends on what it's worth to you. I see. I'll have to sell out, get away from this section, so I'll need some dough. You follow me? All right. I'll see you taken care of now, just what is it you... No, no, you got... no, I ain't safe. I'm talking from a booth. You stay right there at your hotel. I'll see you in a half hour. Right. Just you. No cops. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Beck. Mr. Beck? Yeah, six quarts of milk and two pounds of butter. Sure, right away. Uh, thanks, Mr. Beck. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To the home office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. (music) Item four, 20 cents, a phone call to my friend Lieutenant Garcia of the L.A. Police and a call to Queen of the Angels Hospital. Albert Chrisman, the night watchman who was slugged by the gang of teenage hoodlums during the warehouse robbery, was still unconscious. And Chrisman, unless Red Weller was ready to talk now, was the only lead I had toward finding $100,000 worth of silver blooming coats. I waited two hours and a half for Red Weller, but he didn't show. <laughs> Item five, $2.85, taxi to the warehouse district at the south end of the railroad yards. It was night by now, and the area was almost deserted. A lost, lonely district, shabby and worn, even in the softening darkness, and haunted now by fear. 
The only lights in the block were those shining from the windows of the warehouse office and from Weller's lunchroom across the street. Good evening. Hello. What would you like, sir? A cup of coffee, I guess. Oh, you're lucky. I just made some fresh. Good. Would you like some cream? No, thanks. No. That'll be fine. Is it foggy out? <sighs> yeah, a little. Not bad, though. Hey, this coffee's all right. You're a good cook. Thanks. The boss always has me make it when I'm here. He says I do it better than he does. I'll bet you do. Is the boss around, by the way? No, he he called me and said he had to go out. That's why I'm working. I'm on in the daytime, mostly. Do you have any idea where he might be? No. No, he had to go somewhere, I guess. What'd you want to see him about? He wanted to see me. Do you know where he lives? Well, he's got an apartment over on Marina. It's about eight blocks from here. Think he'd be there? No, he he wasn't going home. He he, he was going out somewhere. He, he acted kind of strange. I, I don't know what he was going to do. May I may I ask just what business you're in? Insurance. Oh. I'm a special investigator. What do you mean? I'm working for the company that insured those furs. Oh. The furs that were stolen the night before last from the warehouse across the street. Oh. Something wrong? Oh, no. No, of course not. I, I, I don't know what you mean. Oh? Can I help you gather up that silverware? Oh, no, no, that's all right. I, gee, I, I, I don't know what happened. Just careless, I guess. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you live around here somewhere? Well, yes, yes, I'm Dalton, uh, three blocks up. What's your name? Carla, Carla Monty. Why are you asking? How long have you worked here, Carla? About a year. Do many teenagers hang out here? What do you mean? Kids, 17, 18, 19. Do many of them come in here for coffee, hamburgers? Well, sometimes, yeah. I've never noticed much. Know any of them? No, no, no. I don't know any of their names. Are you sure? I don't ask them their names. Did I ask you your it's name? It's Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Well, I still didn't ask you. If you want to tell me your... What are you scared of, Carla? Nothing. I'm not scared. You're not? Of course not. Why would I be scared? For the same reason your boss is, Red Weller. He was scared when he talked to me this afternoon and when he phoned me later. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. That's why he didn't come to my hotel. He was afraid to. And why did you drop that silverware when I told you who I am? Because you're scared half to death. No. What's the matter with you people down here? What are you doing, crawling into a hole because a half-grown gang of hoodlums starts throwing their weight around? You don't understand. Then suppose you tell me about it. Do you think that's any kind of an answer in the long run? To pull the covers up over your eyes and let them do as they please and just keep hoping they'll leave you alone? All you're doing is making things worse. No, you don't know how it is. You don't have to live here. No, no, I don't have to live here, but I know how it is. Because I've seen it in other places where the mobs manage to take over. And if you let it happen here, then you'll really have something to be scared of. Maybe, maybe they've already taken over. Who? Oh, a bunch of kids with a gripe on running in packs so they feel safe? Is that the kind of mob you mean, Carla? No. They're not a mob yet, but they will be if they're not stopped. It seems to me you'd have some sense of responsibility to them, if nobody else. Maybe if other people had a sense of responsibility, kids wouldn't have to grow up in a place like this. Have you ever thought of that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, yeah, I've thought of it. But it doesn't hold water. I mean, you'd think so if you lived here. All right, so it's a slum district. And sure, these kids start out with a strike on them. But that's a pretty weak excuse for joining up at criminal bands and terrorizing a whole neighborhood. For slugging people and looting warehouses. Yes, yes, I know. Most of them find other answers. It's only a small minority that turns to crime. But if you let them get away with it, others will join them and they'll grow until finally it's too late. Well, Carla, still nothing to tell me? I can't. I just can't. I see. Well, there's a quarter for the coffee. Keep the change. Good night, Carla. Wait. Yeah? Mr. Dollar. Suppose... Suppose I, I knew someone who, who might be able to help you. I mean, I mean, who might know something about the robbery. Innocently, of course. Uh, if you talk to this person and, uh, and they agree to help you, could you... Well... Could you keep them out of it? Depends on the circumstances. I do all I could, that much I promise. I don't know. 
I'm not sure. You're not sure of what? Of you. Oh, I... I know better when I stop and think, but... I've lived in this neighborhood too long. Lived with these people and... I'm bound by the law like any other citizen. And I won't break it to help somebody cover up a criminal act. But I figure it's up to me sometimes to decide whether a thing is a criminal act. And if a person seems to deserve it, well, I can be pretty lenient. You promise? What you just said? Yes, I promise. I've got to trust you. I've got to trust someone. Do you know such a person, Carla? Yes. Do you know where to find them? I think so. Well, I'm sure they'll be at one of two or three places. Not very far from here. And who is this person? Someone who grew up around here. A boy. Nineteen. What boy? My brother. Expense account item seven, two dollars and seventy cents, taxi. We went first to Carla's apartment where she lived with her brother. But there was no one there. Then we checked out a drive-in a few blocks away, a teenage hangout. No luck. Finally, we tried a pool hall down south of the yards, just off Alameda Street. It was our last hope. I know he comes here. It's not a good place for him, but a lot of the other kids do, too. And he wants to belong. Yeah, sure. Everybody does, in one way or another. Oh, gosh, it had been different if our folks had lived, but... Well, our boy just won't take orders from his sister. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. Thanks. He's not here, then I just don't know where he... Oh, wait. There he is. Down near the corner. The one with the dark, curly hair. All right. Come on. Now take it easy. Just tell him I'm a friend of yours and you want to talk to him. We'll get him off to one side. Oh, whatever you say. Eddie! Yeah? Well, for the... What are you doing here, Carla? Eddie, Eddie, this is Mr. Dollar. A friend of mine. We were... I wonder if we could talk to you for a moment. What about... Well, you You just... know better than to come in a joint like this. But I want to talk to you, Eddie. Well, you can talk to me at home. Now. Go on, get her out of here, will you, mister? It might be a good idea if you listen to her first. I thought it was her that wanted to talk to me. Go on, get her out of here. All right, if you'll go with us. What for? I like it here. It's a nice place. Yeah? At least it's better than San Quentin. What are you talking about? A warehouse robbery, $100,000 worth of furs. I understand you may know something about it. Innocently, of course. I thought you said this guy was a friend of yours. Well, that's right, Eddie. He's just... Who is he? He's an insurance investigator. Oh, so that's the pitch. He's promised to help, Eddie. If, if you'll tell him whatever you know, he'll protect Knock you. Knock it off, get... Carla. Now, look, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. I never even heard of no fur robbery. So take her with you and get out of here. This may be your last chance to get off before the boat sinks, Eddie. You're not leaving, huh? All right, then I'll leave. Eddie! Let him go. We can't force him to talk. I don't know, Mr. Dollar. I don't understand him. I do. Item 8, 10 cents. Phone call from the pool hall to Lieutenant Garcia at police headquarters. He said there was no change in Albert Chrisman's condition yet. He was still holding on, and he still hadn't talked. But there had been another new development, a big one. And when I joined Carla in the taxi outside, she knew it by the look on my face. What's wrong, Mr. Dollar? Now, look. How sure are you that your brother wasn't mixed up in that robbery? Well, I... I want the truth. I... I'm afraid he was mixed up in it. Then brace yourself, Carla. Your boss, Red Weller, who was going to tell me what he knew about it was found murdered in an alley an hour ago. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lonely, broken-hearted girl, a blood-stained shirt, and a fight with a cornered rat. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Wake you up, Johnny? Oh, Garcia, no, just finished breakfast. Oh, you special investigators do live. 
Suppose that insurance company of yours could put me on expense account? Maybe. If you found that hundred grand worth of stolen furs. Just a matter of time, Johnny. Now you're talking like a police lieutenant. How soon can you come down here to headquarters? What's up? Has the watchman talked? Crispin? No, he's still in a coma. But I want to know some more about that kid you mentioned on the phone last night. Petty money? Yeah. Well, I... I don't know. That was told to me in confidence. Not Johnny. I'm going to talk to you like a policeman for a minute. A man named Weller was knifed to death last night. You told me yourself his death is probably tied in with that warehouse robbery. Another man is dying at Queen of the Angels. So, confidence or no confidence, I want to know about that kid. All right, Garcia. I'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 10, $1.45. Taxi from my hotel to the police headquarters office of Lieutenant Garcia. The early morning fog was starting to lift and the city sprawled beneath a slate gray sky. The filtered sun should have softened things, but didn't. Gray sun, gray world, drab and dreary. And a case to match. Teenagers, not a gang of hardened criminals. A bunch of wild kids who'd broken into a warehouse and stolen 80 fur coats, silver blue mink. A night watchman had been slugged and lay dying in the hospital. And a lunchroom owner named Red Weller had been stabbed to death the night before. So it couldn't be called kid stuff. That term doesn't apply to murder. Run those four cards through, Joe. See what you can make on them. Thanks. Now come on into the office, Johnny. This madhouse out here gets you frazzled before you know it. Oh, you police detectives have it pretty soft, Garcia. That's news to me. Teletypes, photo files, record cards, crime labs. How'd you like to try working alone? On your expense account, I could suffer the hardship. Now let's go in here. Have a seat, Johnny. Thanks. Yeah, did I put the fear of the Lord in you on the phone? Oh, you were real impressive. Well, the chief was breathing down my neck. Well, then I'll stop trembling. Getting aside, Johnny, I've got to know just how that Monte boy figures in this. Did I say he even figured in it at all? No, you just wanted some information on him. But he figures all right. You didn't come out here from Hartford to look up the nephew of an old friend. Oh, I've done crazier things at times. He's got a record. Did you know that? No. Petty stuff, no convictions. Huh. Gang brawls, auto-pilfering, vandalism, intoxication. Interrogative attitude, sullen, hostile, antisocial. Yeah, that's quite a nephew you've got, Johnny. Well, I actually with a family. What's the story? How did you get onto this kid? Look, amigo, I made a promise on this. I hate to break it. It's murder, Johnny. <sighs> this kid's sister worked for Red Weller in that lunchroom across the street from the warehouse... Her name is Carla Monty. She's five years older than he is. They live together. Their parents are dead. So? So I put some pressure on her, and she told me she thought her brother Eddie might know something about the robbery. She took me to a pool room to meet him. How was he supposed to have known about it? Hearsay? No, no. She admitted later that she suspected him of being mixed up in it himself. Things he'd said, the way he acted. She asked me to help her try to keep him out of trouble. I think he's already in trouble, Johnny. Yeah, so do I. And I think she does, too. What did he have to say when you talked to him in the pool hall? Several things, but they added up to two words. Get out. When I wouldn't, he did. Hmm. Why do you think Red Weller was killed, Johnny? Well, I think those kids used his lunchroom as a lookout post to spot the prowl car that was patrolling that area. As soon as it passed, they pulled the job. It figures all right. I think Red realized it when he thought back and knew who the kids were. I think that's what he was going to tell me. So they found out what he was up to and knocked him off to shut his mouth. Yeah, it adds up, Garcia. Oh. Now, tell me about her. Carla? Hmm. What's to tell? She's just a girl, like millions of others. Decent, hardworking, and real sweet. But there's something about her, something special. I, I don't know what, I don't know the words to use, but... Well, it's there, you feel it. 
And she's kept it somehow. In spite of everything. I guess I know what you mean. Do you? I told you once, Johnny, I grew up in that district. I know how rough it is. Well, maybe it's even worse for a girl. It is. I know. I had a sister. Oh, I didn't know that. She was a lot like this girl Carla once. Then the district got to her, and she got to be more like Carla's brother. Uh, what happened to her? One to five. Possession of narcotics. A couple of other pretty rough charges. She... She died in Tehachapi Prison seven years ago. I'm... I'm sorry, Garcia. Yeah. I don't want to see this girl, Carla, hurt any more than you do, Johnny. Maybe the hurt will break her, make her lose that something special. But I've still got to pick up her brother and bring him in for questioning. Expense account item 11, $1.90. Taxi to the Weller lunchroom to see Carla Monte. Lieutenant Garcia had a police detail checking known fences and borderline dealers specializing in furs. But so far, none of those contacted had been approached by any member of the warehouse gang. Albert Chrisman, the night watchman who had been slugged during the robbery, was still in a coma, unable to talk. So Carla remained my best, in fact, my only lead to the case. The lunchroom was closed. I paid off the taxi, walked three blocks to Carla's apartment house, climbed the stairs, and knocked on her door. Yes? Who is it? Johnny Dollar. I'd like to talk to you. All right. Just a moment. Come in, Johnny. What were you expecting? A major invasion? I don't know. I don't know what I'm expecting. Easy, Carla. Easy. It's not the end of the world. Eddie didn't come home last night. Oh. I tried, Johnny. I tried to be a mother and father both to him. What did I do wrong? Well, that's the kind of question that doesn't always have an answer. Have you got a drink in the house? Have, have I what? Got anything to drink? Well, there's some brandy, I think. All right, get it. Well, I don't know if it's a good brand or it not. It doesn't matter. Bring two glasses. Pour out a couple of stiff ones. No, I, I don't... Go really ahead and it. pour them, two of them. All right. Is this a snapshot of Eddie when he was younger? Yeah. He was in junior high school then. It was taken at summer camp when he won a medal for swimming. And that was the only year I could afford to send him. Here you are, John. Thanks. All right, here's a go. Oh, I don't think... Now drink it. All of it. All right. <coughs> Good. You needed that. Where do you think he is, Johnny? What's happened to him? Carla, you're going to have to face it sooner or later, and I kind of think now is the time. What do you mean? You've been worried sick for fear your brother would get into some kind of trouble. And you had reason to worry. It's finally happened. No. He's in trouble, all right. Plenty of trouble. You're not the only one looking for him. Who else is? Who do you mean, Johnny? The police. There's an APB oh. out. They want him for questioning in connection with a robbery and with the murder of Red Weller. Oh, no. Eddie wouldn't kill anyone. Maybe not, but somebody did. Some member of the gang that robbed the warehouse. And it looks very much as if Eddie is a member. Yes. I suppose he is. Now, look, Carla. Is there anything you haven't told me about the robbery, I mean? No, no. I, I was just suspicious, that's all. Because if there is, let's have it. It's too late to protect him now. The sooner he's taken into custody, the less likelihood of his getting any even deeper. He was out that night. He didn't come home until almost morning. I was worried about it, but I knew it wouldn't do any good to ask him. Do you know who was with him that night? No. Who would be the most likely ones to go along on a deal like that? Any of them. Any of those he's been running around with lately. Any idea where they hang out mostly? Well, just those two places I took you to last night. That drive-in and the pool hall. Look, if they did pull that robbery, where do you suppose they take the furs? Well, I don't know. Does Eddie have a car? No, but some of the other boys do. Uh-huh. Carla, would you mind if I look through Eddie's room? No, I don't mind. It doesn't matter. I guess nothing much matters now. It's gone so far that... Wait. It's Eddie. He has his own key. All right. Take it easy now. Be careful, Johnny. Says so you're gonna have... What the devil are you doing here? Working for you, Eddie. Yeah? What for? I think you know. Eddie... Eddie, you've got to give yourself up. Shut sure. up. Because I got you to thank for this jam. This insurance dick comes around, romances you up a little, and you sell me right down the river. That's not true. How'd you know you were in a jam, Eddie? I got friends in this neighborhood. They keep me posted. Did the same friends tell you Red Weller was about to make a deal to talk? You're whistling in the dark, Dollar. Maybe. 
I imagine Garcia will find out, though, when he gets you down to headquarters. Get your hand off that phone. Oh, so you've got a gun. Eddie, Eddie, don't. Please. Keep out of this. Move back against that wall, Dollar. Put your hands flat against that wall. You keep them there. Give me some clothes, Carla. Come on, make it fast. What are you going to do, Eddie? I said give me some clothes. All right, Eddie. You're wrong, though. You're making a big mistake, Eddie. It's no use running. You'll only... A... Eddie. What's the matter? Down there in the street. A police car just pulled up. You're lying. Stay where you are, Dollar. I to kill you, Carla. You're the one that brought him here. I'm trying to let him trap me. I think I'll pull a bullet on you before I leave. You fire one shot and you won't have a chance. They'll be in here before you can get out of the hallway. You better make up your mind, Eddie. Well, you've still got time. Stay where you are, Dollar. I'm trying to come after me. Eddie, please. Give yourself up, Eddie. Stop him, Johnny. I'm afraid it's a little late. Why did you let him go? There was no choice, Carla. He'd have killed you if I'd moved. Well, you'd better give me that list of his friends. The police will want it. Heaven help him. Yeah. That's about all that can help him now. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a police net tightens and traps a frightened rat. A boy sobs in a jail cell. And an innocent man dies quietly in his sleep. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Garcia, Johnny. Are the boys in the police car still there? There are three police cars here now. They've searched the apartment house from top to bottom. Any luck? No, Eddie got away. I didn't dare make a move to stop him. He was going to shoot his sister. Well, we'll get him, Johnny. Don't worry about it. I don't intend to. My job now is to locate $100,000 worth of stolen furs, not to go after Eddie Money. It's the same job, isn't it? Probably. Did you see that list of his friends Carla gave me? I just put out an APB to bring them in. Good. They weren't all in on that warehouse robbery, but some of them were. If they were, we'll take them. We've got an interrogation room down here to sort the sheep from the goats. Yeah, I know. But first, you've got to catch your goats. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the band with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the Home Office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. Item 12, two cents, for the way I felt. I hung up the phone and walked to the window, stood there looking out into the street. The police were leaving the apartment to carry their search for fugitive Eddie Monty into wider territory. And Eddie's sister, Carla, sat huddled in a corner, forlorn, beaten, broken-hearted. From the window, too, the view was anything but cheerful. Dirty, cluttered streets lined by row on row of sagging tenements, drab and gray in the weakening light of late afternoon. This was the slums that had spawned Eddie Monty, raised and nurtured him, made him into a member of a gang, and had now sent him fleeing from the police with a gun in his hand. And the same slum had bred the others of the gang, who'd robbed a warehouse of 80 silver blue mink coats, slugged night watchman Albert Grisman into a near-death coma, and had murdered a man who'd tried to give them away. Why, Johnny? What got into him? Why is he ending up this way? I wish I could tell you, Carla. I did something wrong. That's it, of course, but, but what? Forget it. You did all you could. It wasn't enough. Well, sometimes nothing is enough. And nobody knows exactly why. I loved him. I, I, I never thought of him as, as just a nuisance of a kid brother, the way a lot of girls do. Now, look. You did more than anybody could expect. You were a pretty young kid when your folks died. Too young to have to take on the responsibility of raising a teenage brother. 
But I tried. I tried hard. And I thought I was doing all right until lately. But now this... So it didn't work. And what's happened is breaking your heart. Well, that can't be changed. But just remember this one thing. You did the best you could. And that's all anybody can do. So don't blame yourself. Tell me something, Johnny. Yeah? You're wearing a gun. I don't think Eddie knew it when he ran from here. Maybe you couldn't have used it to disarm him. Not when he was on the verge of killing you. But you could have drawn it and killed him. He was careless. He gave you several chances. Why didn't you? I don't know. Thank you, Johnny. I'd like to look through Eddie's room, if you don't mind. All right. I'll go with you. This way, it's down the hall. Thanks. Well, somehow I still can't believe it. Not the killing, at least. Eddie is just not that kind. Well, a kid gets under pressure sometimes and gets pushed overboard. Maybe we'll know more when they pick him up. What if he... What if he tries to resist arrest? You know the answer to that. Oh, I hope he doesn't. Well, here it is. This has been Eddie's room since he was 13. It ought to tell something. The main thing at the moment is to find something that tells where he might go to hide out. And I've also got $100,000 worth of furs to locate. But you, you go ahead and look around. Whatever you want. Okay, thanks. I'll be in the living room. You, you call me if you want me. For the sake of company, I switched on a beat-up record player in the corner. And I looked at six years of a boy's life, accumulated in one room. Comic books, hot rod magazines, school mementos, knickknacks, photographs. Junk mostly to anybody but the owner. I went through all of it, then through the drawers and chest and through his clothes. Nothing. I looked over the photographs stuck in the mirror, tacked on the wall. Some of the names on the boys' pictures were the same as those on the list Carla had given to the police. There were a few pictures of girls and a lot of pictures of hot rods. I picked up an envelope of loose photographs lying on the dresser. They were views of a second-hand panel truck, and in all of the pictures, Eddie was standing beside the truck with obvious pride of ownership. One of the views showed the front license plate. I turned the envelope over. The film had been developed less than two weeks before. I called Carla back into the room and asked her about it. No. No, I didn't know he had a car, or a truck, rather. It may not be his, but I'll lay odds that it is. That look on his face is a dead giveaway. I don't know. He sure kept it a secret. He never brought it here once. Do you recognize the background on those pictures? No. No, I don't. It looks like a storage yard or, or an industrial place of some kind, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd call it that. Do you mind if I take these with me? Of course not. But why? The gang had to use something to haul those furs away from the warehouse. But if... Eddie was keeping the truck a secret from me. It was because he was planning to use it for the robbery. That one or some other one. Johnny, he was in on it all along. Look, Carla, I've got a hunch Eddie is the leader of that gang. Oh, no. I think the truck was used in the robbery, and I think when we find it, we'll find the furs and we'll find Eddie. See you later, Carla. Expense account item 13, $1.85. Taxi fare from Carla's apartment to the police headquarters office of Lieutenant Garcia. Come in. Oh, Johnny, I've been trying to locate you. Oh, what's up? We picked up two of those kids on Carla Monte's list. Friends of Eddie's. Wow, that's a start. Not with one of them. He's in the clear. Perfect alibi. We have something on the other one, though. Want to help me talk to him? Yeah, sure. Oh, say, here are some photographs I picked up in Eddie's room a while ago. We should take a look at them, Garcia. All right, let's see them. The pictures were taken about two or three weeks ago. Now, if this truck is his, his sister doesn't know about it. Yeah, he sure got that owner look on his face. Yeah, he sure has. That second one there shows the license number, see? Yeah, yeah, I see it. You think they might have used this in the robbery, Johnny? It's a possibility. And we're not exactly swamped with angles. I was wondering, too, if you happen to recognize that background behind the truck. No. No, but it looks like it might be down in that area somewhere, the warehouse district. Look, why don't you get some copies made, circulate them, and see if any of your boys can tag the place. Oh, you insurance dicks do get ideas sometimes. Oh, you'd be amazed. All right, I'll do it. And now let's go down and talk to that kid. In 
Interrogation room 519 was on the fifth floor. Bare walls painted gray, a business-like room without adornment or compromise. Furnished only with the necessary table, chairs, and lights. We stopped in the ante room and looked in through the one-way glass window. The boy waited alone at the interrogation table, trying to put up a tough, defiant front, but failing by the tremble of a lip and the occasional flick of his eyes. Well, let's go in. Get it over with. The kid stiffened when he heard the door open, but he didn't turn around. He just sat there at the table, braced and waiting. You can take that chair at the side, Johnny. Okay, thanks. What's your name? You already know it. I said, what's your name? Mario Centaurus. That's your right name? Yeah. Where do you live? Roxman Place, my aunt. Ever been arrested before, Mario? No. Hey, you've got kind of a bad memory, haven't you? Why? September of last year. Arrest made by Officer C.J. Barton. Charge, possession of stolen articles. Hubcap, two auto radios, one camera. I wasn't convicted. I asked if you'd ever been arrested. Not convicted. It was a frame-up. I didn't have any evidence. No, apparently not. Witnesses for the prosecution refused to testify. Case dismissed. Here, what are you going to claim this time, Mario? Another frame-up? I don't know why you brought me in here. I don't know anything about anything. That bad memory again, hmm? I just don't know what you're talking about. It's lucky for us that Eddie Monty had such a good memory, isn't yes, it? Yes, What it's about a... Eddie? Huh? What, what do you mean? Is he a friend of yours? I know him. He's got a fine memory, that boy. Too bad you can't remember things the way he does. What are you talking about? Oh, that's true, all right. Eddie remembers everything that happened. What he did, what Mario did. I don't know what you mean. Oh, that's because of your bad memory, Mario. Why, Eddie remembers the name of every boy who was in on that job and just what each one of them did. What job? That warehouse robbery. Have you forgotten about that? I don't know anything about any robbery. Well, there's been a lot of talk. At least you've heard about it, haven't you? I don't know anything about it. Maybe you've just forgotten. I don't know what you're talking about. When did you see Eddie last? I don't remember. Have you seen him since the robbery? No. How can you be sure? You said you hadn't heard of any robbery. Well, I... I haven't. Still, you haven't seen Eddie since the robbery. Well, I... Come on, Mario. Tell us about it. I guess maybe I did hear about it. So? Well, why shouldn't I hear? It was in the papers. Everybody's been talking about it, so what if I did hear it? I don't prove anything. But you said you hadn't heard. So I forgot. Guy can forget something, can't he? Yeah. If he's got a bad memory, he can. Now, Mario's got a real bad memory, Johnny. Not Eddie, though. He remembers how you guys loaded those furs into his truck. How you waited across the street in Red Wellers until the prowl car passed. How you slugged the night watchman, Albert Christmas. That's a lie. How do you know it is, Mario? You don't even remember it. Eddie does, though. He even remembers the next night. When you stabbed Red Weller to death to keep him from coming to me. No. No, I didn't do that. Of course you did. You don't think Eddie would lie, do you? It's not true. Makes sense to us. Is Eddie here? You pick him up? How would we know what he remembers unless we picked him up? Now, how do you think we got your name? Out of the telephone book? It's not true what Eddie says. Well, if you've got anything to say, we'll listen to it. But I don't think it's necessary, do you, Johnny? No, I think Eddie remembers everything. Let's get out of here. Yeah. He's lying! You listen to me. I'll tell you the truth. I'll get a stenographer. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a cautious search, an ambush, bullets and tears. And the end is violence. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar speaking, Lieutenant Garcia's office. Johnny, you're the one I was trying to reach. This is Carla Monte. Oh, I was going to phone you later. What's happening? Have they found Eddie yet? Not yet. But the police picked up one of his friends, Mario Centauris. Oh, Mario, I know him. Well, he's been to the apartment lots of times. Was he in on the robbery? 
Yes, he just made a statement admitting it. And what did he say about my brother? He says Eddie is the one who planned the whole thing. He must be lying. No, Garcia and I are pretty sure he's telling the truth. I'm sorry, Carla. I'm coming down to headquarters, Johnny. There's no use. There's nothing you can do here. At least I can be there when they bring him in or whatever happens. It won't help. You're better off at home. Now, please. I raised him. Some of the fault must be mine. I can't desert him. I'm going to be there if he needs me. Okay, Carla. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the Home Office Moto Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account, final page. $100,000 worth of fur coats, silver blue minks, stolen in a warehouse robbery and still missing. A night watchman slugged during the robbery by one of the teenage gang, still lying in a coma, unable to speak. And Red Weller, a man who tried to speak, lay in the county morgue, stabbed to death in a dark alley. But now one of the gang had been arrested, a 17-year-old named Mario Santores, and he'd finally talked. Sitting in Garcia's office, I read Mario's statement through for the second time. Well, what do you think, Johnny? I think the kid was telling the truth. Eddie Monty scraped up enough money to buy that second-hand panel truck and then talked the other kids into knocking over the warehouse. That ties in with what Eddie's sister said, that he'd kept the truck a secret, hadn't told her about it. And also the fact that Eddie seems to be a born leader type. They even mentioned it in one of his former records of arrest. Yeah, I think we can buy it that Eddie Monte is the leader of the gang. Yeah. All right, they picked their night. They cased the place from Red Weller's lunchroom across the street. And as soon as the prowl car passed, they made their move. They got the watchman, Albert Crisman, to open the door by showing him a fake telegram through the window. That's another thing that checks out Mario's story, Johnny. Mario claims he's the one who showed the telegram. That's right. Crisman kept saying, kid with a mark on his arm. And Mario's got a bad scar on his left wrist. That's what I mean. It checks out. Mario didn't know what Crisman had told us. All right, so they got inside, and then, according to Mario's version, it was Eddie Monty who slugged the watchman. Probably true. Then they jumped the other watchman in the dark and started hauling out the furs, loading them into the truck of Eddie's. They knew they had 45 minutes before the prowl car came back through. By that time, they'd finished and split up, Eddie driving the truck away alone and the others disappearing on foot. I think that's about the size of it. And I think Mario's telling the truth when he says neither he nor any of the others know where Eddie planned to hide out the truck. And Red Weller, according to Mario, was murdered by another gang member. What was his name? Chewy Morel. Yeah. Well, if that's true, Eddie Monty is at least clean on the murder charge. If it's true. All you can tag him on is robbery and assault on that watchman. I'm kind of glad of it, Johnny. I feel sorry for that sister of his. So do I. She's a good kid. And she's carrying a real load of guilt. Thinks that she's responsible in some way. Oh, she was only 19 herself when their folks died. How could she be expected to hold him in line? And especially in that district. Yeah. She's on her way down here, by the way. Carla Monte? Yeah, yeah. I tried to talk her out of it. Oh, maybe she's as well off hanging around here, though, as she is waiting alone in that apartment. It's a rough deal for her, no matter where she waits. Well, at least we can tell her her brother's not in quite as deep as we can. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Garcia speaking. Good. Well, who's the other one? Yeah, yeah, bring them on in and book them. I'll talk to them later. And now we... What? When? All right. Keep in touch with me. The boys just picked up Chewy Morel and the other two. That leaves us one to go. Yeah, the big one. Eddie Monte. And he's even bigger now, Johnny. What do you mean? That watchman, Eddie Slugged, Albert Crisman. What about him? He just died. So it was a different thing we had to tell Carla when she arrived at headquarters. Not that her brother would probably get off on a lesser charge. But instead that an APB was out, that every officer in town had been warned, be on the lookout for Eddie Monty, age 19, armed and dangerous, wanted for murder. Expense account item 15, $12.50, rent on a hired car. 
One of Garcia's boys was certain that the background appearing in the photograph of Eddie's truck was somewhere in his district, but he couldn't tag the exact spot. So I decided to cruise that area street by street. Carla Monte, Eddie's sister, went along with me. There's an alley off to the right, Johnny. It might be worth a look. Yeah, it runs back toward a lumberyard there. That could be a lumberyard in the background of that photograph. Well, we'll give it a try. This isn't it, Johnny. Sally makes a right angle turn there before it even gets to the lumber yard. Oh, we may as well check it on through. It seems to run clear on down to the railroad yards. Oh, please let us find him. If it's the police, he'll fight. And he'll kill someone else. Be killed himself, maybe. It's out of your hands now, Carl. It's got to work itself out in its own way. And there's nothing much anybody can do to stop it or change it. I know, Johnny. I keep trying to fool myself. All the time I know. Well, all you can do is hope... Look! That fence ahead of us there, next to the railroad yards. Yeah, that could be the fence in these pictures. It looks the same. And that storage shed there at the right, that's in one of the shots. Yeah. And that pile of oil drums. This is it, Carla. This is where those films were taken. The truck was parked right at the corner of that shed. Well, it looks as though that off chance paid off. I'm scared, Johnny. Now that it's so close, I'm scared. Don't be. By off chance, I meant just finding the place. He may not have come back here since the day those pictures were taken. You don't believe that, and you know it. Look, Carla, that house back at the corner has a phone. There's a wire running in from the pole. Go back there and use it to call Lieutenant Garcia. Give him the location and tell him to hit the radio and have this whole area blocked off. Got it? Yes. Tell him to cover the railroad yard, too. Sew up this whole section tight and tell him to make it fast. Johnny. Yeah. Eddie may be watching us from around here somewhere right this minute. I waited until she'd gone. Then I got out of the car and walked toward the shed and the sagging wooden fence that bordered the railroad yards. It was nearly dark now. The high floodlights had been turned on above the crisscross network of gleaming steel tracks. Shadows play tricks at such a time of evening, and I got sudden movements now and then from the corner of my eyes, but, well, yet nothing really moved. And the only sound was the sound of my own footsteps. I stopped several times and stood watching and listening, but nothing moved. There was only silence. I reached the door of the long wooden shed and found it padlocked. But looking in through a broken window, I could see the lock didn't matter. The shed was empty and long abandoned. Between it and the fence was a drive leading toward the rear. And behind the shed in a loading area, I found Eddie's truck. And in the back of it was $100,000 worth of furs. All right, darling. Huh? Get your hands up. Eddie, you're in a rut. That's the first thing you said to me the last time we met. I ought to killed you there in that apartment. Isn't one killing enough? I don't suppose you know it, but Albert Chrisman died this afternoon. I know. I got a radio in the truck there. That's where you've been hiding out all the time? Look, if I wanted to answer questions, I'd go turn myself in. You may be better off in the long run if you do. Now get... You here alone? No, no, your sister's with me. Oh, for the luck. What does she want to do? Watch me get it? Why don't you give me that gun, Eddie? It's only a matter of time. You know that. You don't have a chance. Oh, I figure I got a pretty good chance right here in my hand. Chance at what? To break Carla's heart? Smash her into the dirt killer, maybe? Shut up. What more do you want to do to her before you're through? I'm not planning to be through. Oh, that's great. But the police are doing some planning of their own. They gotta find me first. I found you, didn't I? And I ought to kill you right where you're standing. Is that all you gotta think about, Eddie? To kill somebody and go on killing until one of them kills you? Shut up! Will you... Let me think. Think about Carla if you want to think about something. Think about the things she's done for you, the years she's worked for you, worried about you. Uh, that dame was born to worry. Nobody's born to worry. They inherit worries like you were inherited by her. I didn't ask her to do it. Life didn't give her any choice. But it's too late now to talk about that. It's all over, Eddie. This is the wind-up. Come on, I'll give yourself up. You haven't got a chance. Oh, and I would have if I gave myself up? Don't you hand me that stuff. The police have got this whole section surrounded. Carla went to call them 20 minutes ago. If I thought you were trying to hand Johnny. me... Keep your mouth shut. Eddie, you don't have a chance. Johnny, Lieutenant Garcia's here. Be careful, Eddie's here. You dirty... I hit the dirt and rolled into the truck and came up on the other side with my gun in my hand. I could hear Eddie running away, but I couldn't tell where he was. Johnny, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Eddie went over the fence into the yards. Where are you? Here, the corner of the shed. Come on, let's go after him. He can't get through. I've got men working this way from the other side. Where's Carla? Back there somewhere. 
Come on, we can get through the fence here. Carla, stay where you are. Don't follow us. There he goes, Johnny. Behind that line of freight cars. All right, come on. He can't get too far that way. There's a train coming. There he goes. He's going to try to beat it. The crazy Eddie. Santa Maria. I don't know, Johnny. There must be better ways to die. Expense account item 16, $300.60. Hotel and miscellaneous in Los Angeles and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $541.25. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Well, I guess Carla made the remarks for me. I don't know, Johnny. Those 80 fur coats, they'll go back into stock now. They'll be sold to women who will wear them to parties and dances and nightclubs. And they'll be happy in them. And they'll never know about Eddie or about me or what happened here tonight. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the matter of the medium, well done. And a seance or two that I think you'll like. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Shawnee Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Edgar Barrier, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Tommy Cook, and Richard Crenna. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>